Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Uh, we are pleased. We are pleased to welcome our speaker today, Dr. We are pleased to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Tom Hyde. Tom M. Hyde, MD, PhD, is the Chief Medical Officer of the Lieber Institute for Brain Development. The mission of the Lieber Institute is to identify genes that confer increased risk for schizophrenia and related neurodevelopmental behavioral disorders. Under his supervision, the Lieber Institute has established one of the world's largest and most extensive curated brain tissue collections for research. Dr. Hyde is a professor in the Department of Neurology and Psychiatric and Behavioral Sciences at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. He is on the board of directors of the Shepard Pratt Lieber Research Institute, a clinical research center focused on understanding the biology of schizophrenia, autism, and other neuropsychiatric disorders. Dr. Hyde graduated with his MD, PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. He served his medical internship at the Penn Presbyterian Medical Center, followed by a neurology residency at Stanford University. There is so much more to Tom's resume that I left out, <laughs> but maybe you'll get an inkling of that during his talk. Tom has been a member of the temple for more than a decade. So we're pleased to welcome Tom, and I give the mic to you. Thank you. I think you all will be able to hear me fairly well. I've never been accused of having a very soft voice. So I'm going to try and take you through a little bit of a clinical and research journey into uh, bipolar disorder. Uh, the, I work at the Lieber Institute for Brain Development. Uh, Hopefully this is working. Um, which is located in Baltimore on the medical campus of Johns Hopkins University. We're a freestanding biomedical research institute. We were funded by gifts from two Jewish families, uh, the Lieber family and the Maltz family. The Lieber's from uh, New York and the Maltz family is from Cleveland. And uh, Milton Maltz in particular has been very involved in Jewish philanthropy over the years and is very um, invested actually in uh, Israeli-American scientific collaboration, particularly in the biomedical sphere. Both of these families have individual experimental illnesses and they have been extremely generous to the tune of over $150 million donated to the Lieber Institute to support our, our research. The Institute's been in existence for approximately 12 years. I was actually the first employee of the Institute. And our, our mission, as, as, as uh, you were told by Harriet, is to find the biological bases for major mental illnesses because these illnesses are organically based fundamentally with changes in brain structure, function, and chemistry, and then to develop new treatments for it. I can try if this is working. Um, I'll speak louder. How about that? I don't think the mic is actually working that well. Um, so uh, the Lieber Institute has about 120 employees. We're very focused on science. And one of the, um, one, one of the uh, gems of the Lieber Institute is our postmortem brain collection. I say modestly since I'm director of the Human Postmortem Brain Repository. So we have uh, roughly uh, 4,000 specimens. Uh, those are whole human brains that have been donated to the Institute. We are currently accruing brains at about 500 brains a year. And why we get so many brains will become apparent when I discuss a little bit about the research that we do with the brains. Now, we don't collect the brains because we're like stamp collectors putting them in books. We collect them to use them in research studies. And where do these brains come from is always of great interest to people. Our brains come from medical examiner's offices. And I gave a lecture here, I don't know, four or five years ago about the Lieber Institute and a little bit about our research there. But when everybody um, is born and dies in this country, uh, your birth and your death is registered with governmental agencies for a whole variety of reasons. If you're a believer in QAnon, it's because you're going to have computer chips implanted in you by Bill Gates um, to be controlled. 
Um, but if you're a little bit less uh, paranoid or suspicious, it's because there are very important public health and public uh, uh, governmental functions that are dependent upon the population, both in their birth, life, and death. And so when you die, uh, and hopefully nobody here will die very soon, uh, your death gets reported, no matter what jurisdiction you live in, to uh, the medical examiner's office. And every state has their medical examiner's offices. And if there is suspicion or the death is um, from a manner of death that has not been fully explained by the circumstances where you are found when you're deceased, then you end up at the medical examiner's office, often with an investigation and an autopsy. And so in the state of Maryland, for example, there is one medical examiner's office for the whole state of Maryland located in Baltimore, right next door to the University of Maryland Medical Center in West Baltimore. And when anybody dies in the state of Maryland, uh, usually the police uh, or the hospital, if you die in an emergency or in the hospital, notifies the medical examiner's office of the death. And if you die unattended or in a manner uh, where there might be some suspiciousness, uh, your uh, a field investigator will be dispatched. If you're 90 years old and had a heart condition and you're found deceased in bed, they'll probably just take a quick look at you. And if nothing looks untoward, like your ungrateful grandchild had pushed you down the stairs, um, you will uh, get signed off on. But if there's any suspiciousness or you're in a younger age group, you'll be transported up to the medical examiner's office in Baltimore where there, your case will be thoroughly reviewed. And uh, for public health reasons, uh, for example, uh, during COVID to try and assess how widespread COVID infections were and the, and the mortality associated with those. And a lot of people died unattended at home during the COVID epidemic. Um, you will often get an autopsy done. And when an autopsy is done, we have a team that works at the medical examiner's office in Maryland that works with the medical examiners who are physicians. They're autopsy pathologists. And we reach out and contact the families if there is uh, sufficient reason to believe either the person who acted as a normal control or the person had a, a mental or neurological disorder of interest to our research team. And so this slide I have up here is a little bit of a summary, I don't know how clear it is on the screen, of, of the cases that we collect at the Lieber Institute. And you'll see in blue in the uh, pie chart over here that most of the cases are predominantly male. Does anybody have a reason understanding why they might be male? Well, other than the fact that men are probably uh, biologically weaker than females, and this is actually a fact, not in the sense of muscle strength, but in the sense of longevity and uh, susceptibility to a variety of illnesses. But the biggest illness associated with men has to do with impulsivity and aggressivity. And so oftentimes men will end up in the medical examiner's office because they die under suspicious circumstances, either in accidents or in fights uh, or in murders or things along those lines. So we do have a slight male predominance, but we do collect an awful lot of men and women. We also collect all uh, genetic ancestries, African-American, Asian-American, Hispanic American. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Try that. I'm fine. I don't know if it's doing. Can you hear me any better? Okay. Um, and so we collect um, of all genetic ancestries um, and our collection in the state of Maryland pretty well mirrors the demography of the state of Maryland as far as what we call genetic ancestry. We get a very good buy-in from the African-American community. Uh, probably the hardest groups to collect brains from are those people who are uh, immigrants to this country. Culturally, in many countries, um, autopsies are not done. For example, in China, where I have a number of scientific colleagues, autopsies are almost never done, even in cases of murder. Uh, and so there has been a great deal of difficulty for Chinese researchers studying brain diseases to gain brain tissue. And the brain is probably one of the only organs in, in, in the body that you can't biopsy and take a piece of brain tissue to study. We don't biopsy brains unless we suspect a tumor. And that's because you don't want to damage any brain tissue because we use every part of our brain in a variety of functions. So if you want to study brain diseases, you really have to study autopsy-based brain tissue, which has its benefits and its limitations. Um, 
but we do collect a lot of brains. And we also have sites distributed around the country in order to capture a wide diversity of genetic ancestries. So we have a site in Michigan, uh, actually two sites in Michigan. One is the medical examiner's office in Kalamazoo, which has a very large Native American, uh, as well as uh, a European American or white uh, population, non-Hispanic white population. We have a collection site with Gift of Life of Michigan, which encompasses the whole state of Michigan, which is a transplant service, but they also recover brains for research with us. And that captures a large African-American as well as white population in Michigan, and to a lesser extent, a Middle Eastern. Uh, there's a very large uh, Christian Arab community in Michigan, so we are getting uh, some brains from those individuals. We have a site in North Dakota, in Eastern North Dakota, the University of North Dakota School of Medicine, uh, North Dakota is a gigantic state, um, and uh, even though it's so huge, uh, they only have about 500,000 people living in the whole state. What's interesting about North Dakota is, by percentage-wise, they have the largest Native American community in the United States. So about 15% of the population of North Dakota is Native American. We get a large number of cases of Native American ancestry from that group. And then our other site is out in uh, California, in Santa Clara County Medical Examiner, which is the county for San Jose, which is a very large city, very diverse, with the large a Asian American and Hispanic community. Uh, and we get uh, brains uh, from those groups, uh, and uh, they're hard to get, once again, because those are largely immigrant communities. Um, so we collect brains from all over, but all of our research is really conducted here in Maryland and Baltimore, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about bipolar disorder. Um, this just gives you a sense of the diversity of diagnoses that we get. We get a lot of what we call neurotypical. That's the new word we use for normal controls. Uh, but we also, the largest group we get is major depression. We collect a lot of bipolar, schizophrenia, post-traumatic stress disorder, eating disorders, Alzheimer's, a smaller group of autism uh, and other neurodevelopmental disorders along the autism spectrum. Uh, and uh, Parkinson's disease, obsessive compulsive, you name it, we actually have it in our collection. But the, what we really focus on are primarily complex behavioral disorders like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and depression. So bipolar disorder. People often throw the word bipolar around quite um, indiscriminately. Uh, bipolar doesn't mean that your mood fluctuates. It means your mood fluctuates beyond the bounds of what we consider normal from both the range of depression, too low, and hypomania, too high, and mania, way too high. And it's a fairly common disorder. You probably have heard of a lot of these people on this list who have bipolar disorder. A number of them have been quite public about their, their struggles. Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys, who took a long hiatus from music because he was so severely afflicted with bipolar disorder. Carrie Fisher, uh, who sadly passed away, uh, had a great deal of difficulty and struggles with bipolar disorder. Uh, Ted Turner was, has been quite outspoken about his bipolar disorder and has been supportive of bipolar research through his foundation. And Winston Churchill, who we all think of as, as having depression, he was quite public about the black dog that he said followed him around. But he would also go into spells where he would work continuously for three to five days without sleeping, which is really the hallmark of a hypomanic or manic phase. And so what I'd like to start off with is a little bit about the clinical diagnoses of bipolar disorder and give you a little bit of information about bipolar from a clinical perspective and, and how it might impact individuals. So in order to diagnose psychiatric disorders, there is a compendium called the DSM. And it's published by the American Psychiatric Association, and we're, they're up to the fifth version of it. It's revised about every five to eight years, and then they sell several million copies at a cost of several hundred dollars per volume. It's now up to about 800 pages long. And what it's really valuable for is it sets out the diagnostic criteria, so there's some standardization. Not just in this country, it's sort of the Bible of diagnosis of, of neuropsychiatric disease around the world. And it lists what are the core symptoms of each disorder. And why is that important? Number one, you want uniformity of diagnoses. 
So if you see one doctor to another doctor, you can be fairly sure that the diagnostic criteria employed by one doctor is the same as another one if you move around in this transient world where people are constantly changing doctors and changing facilities. The second reason is there is an important uh, treatment regimen imposed by the diagnoses. And so we know that certain drugs have been well validated for certain diagnoses. You wouldn't want to give the wrong medication to the wrong patient. It's like having an infection. You wouldn't want to treat a strep infection with the same antibiotic that you would use for a urinary tract infection. You want to treat the infection with the antibiotic that is most specific to relieve the signs and symptoms of your disorder. It's the same thing with mental disorders. So it's very important to have diagnostic clarity for treatment purposes. And then there's prognosis. Everybody wants their doctor to tell them, look into your crystal ball and tell me what's going to happen to me. And it gets to be particularly important because some of these disorders look at times like other disorders. So for example, particularly in older folks, when they get depressed, some people become psychotic. They start hearing voices. They become paranoid. And those symptoms you also see in schizophrenia, hearing voices and paranoid. But schizophrenia usually starts in your 20 and, it's, and you treat it with antipsychotics. But when somebody is older, you may use some antipsychotic very briefly to alleviate the psychotic symptoms, but the psychotic symptoms are part of their depression. And for long term, you want to put them on antidepressants. And that's especially important in older people because antipsychotic medications have a lot of cardiac side effects. And there's an increased risk of what we call sudden death in older folks on antipsychotics, which we don't want to give older folks antipsychotics if we can avoid it. So diagnosis is important for treatment, and that's why we have this Bible. So bipolar disorder comes in a multitude of flavors. There's bipolar one, there's bipolar two, and there's something called cyclothymia. But all of them have in common that they have to have depressive episodes, which meet the criteria for major depression. So you have to have depression, clear-cut depressive episodes. And you also have to have what we call manic or hypomanic episodes. And we'll go into that a little bit. Um, but hypomania means slightly under, and hyper, of course, means above in, 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 uh, in Latin. Um, Let's see. So in manic episodes, everybody always talks about, oh, I seem, I'm a little manic today. And what do you mean by that? Well, in the clinical form of mania, these people often have either a lot of irritability, or they can be happy, or they can even be euphoric, over the top happy. They often speak more quickly than normal. They become much more verbose. They can't focus, they have what we call flight of ideas, their minds are jumping from topic to topic to topic. They run around trying to do a million things at once and get nothing accomplished. Their sleep cycle is completely messed up. So they may not sleep at all for days, which is very hard on the body. Or if they do sleep, they'll just sleep for a few hours. Sometimes people get so manic, they become grandiose. So they start thinking that they're an angel or a prophet or a, or, or a famous person, or they have to talk to somebody famous in the government. So when you hear about somebody running down Wisconsin Avenue, saying that God has sent them to the White House to save the country, chances are they are in a manic episode. And sometimes people, or they're one of the Proud Boys, the Proud Boys and they're probably more paranoid than manic, but they certainly have uh, some grandiose inflated ideas of their, of the, of their worth. Um, there are fine criteria, how long does a manic episode have to last, and, or a hypomanic episode, but basically the difference between bipolar one and bipolar two is in bipolar one you have frank manic episodes, which are really over the top, and they're not too hard to recognize. And in hypomanic episodes, it's just tamped down a little bit. And a lot of people, function very well with hypomanic episodes. So they get very energetic, they can get a lot accomplished. And the people with bipolar two don't really like to be treated for their hypomania because that's often the most productive times they have in their life. However, some of those people can tip occasionally into full-blown mania. Nobody accomplishes anything very much when they're manic. And it's really quite, quite disabling. 
As I said before, with bipolar one, you have to have at least one clear-cut episode of mania that goes on for a certain amount of time. Bipolar two, you have to have that depressive episode with an episode of, of, of hypomania. There are people who don't quite reach those peaks and valleys along the way, and we call that cyclothymia. There are people who flip back and forth very rapidly between depression and hypomania or depression and mania. We call those rapid cyclers. And those people are really, really disabled because even in the course of the day or in the course of the week, they can be depressed, they can be hypomanic or manic, depressed, up and down, up and down, up and down. And you can imagine how disabling that is and how disruptive that is to the family life. So I always say in, in neuropsychiatry, behavioral neurology, when you have a behavioral disorder, you have the patient who is the person suffering from the disorder. And there is a lot of psychic pain associated with this. But then also you have the family. And it's like throwing a stone into a pool of water. The ripples not only affect the stone that's sinking to the bottom, but the ripples themselves reverberate through friends and family and coworkers. And there are many people who are affected by a person with severe mental illness. So those of you who have had family members or yourself who suffered from these illnesses, the economic and social costs are enormous from these illnesses. And so treatment and effective treatment becomes very important. As I mentioned to you before, bipolar disorder is uniquely difficult because many patients enjoy being hypomanic. And they're willing to take the risk of even flipping into mania. Oops. Uh, let's see if I can go back. No. There, no. Okay. So, how common is, is, is bipolar disorder? In the adult population, probably about 1% uh, of the uh, adult population, it's fairly common, suffer from bipolar uh, 1. Bipolar 2 is a, depends upon who's doing the rating, somewhere between 0.5% to 2% of the adult population. Cyclothymia is much more common. The average age of onset is usually later than schizophrenia. It's in the late 20s, early 30s. Um, it's often more often diagnosed in men than women because men can become quite aggressive during their manic episodes and that always draws the attention of law enforcement and that often leads to diagnosis. Women tend to experience more depressive episodes. Men tend to have more manic or hypomanic episodes. It is a very disabling <coughs> illness. Part of that has to do with the fact that a lot of these patients, uh, as soon as they start feeling like their mood is normalized, they stop their medication. And it's the biggest problem we have is medication compliance. Because the medications work well and they make people normal and say, hey, I'm normal, I don't need the medication. Or even in the back of their minds, or not so far in the back of their minds, they're like, hey, you know, I sort of enjoy being hypomanic. I get a lot of stuff done when I'm hypomanic. I'm going to come off my medication. I feel too flat. I like that up and down. I like what I feel like. And it can be quite uh, hard to keep your med patients on medications, even with good family support. Uh, suicide is unfortunately quite high in these individuals. Um, and it is what I consider to be the same thing in psychiatric disease as uh, relapsing cancer. It's treatment failure. And uh, we have a, a large percentage of our brain collection comes from individuals well diagnosed with bipolar disorder who committed suicide. I should mention that comorbid substance abuse is very common in bipolar patients, extremely common. Um, some of that's self-medication. So they'll use things like uh, cannabis or alcohol to dampen out some of their, their, their mood swings a little bit. Um, they're also very impulsive, so they don't consider consequences, so they're more apt to get involved in, 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 in uh, substance abuse. And there's another problem we have, and that is certain substances can induce a manic episode in susceptible people. So that's primarily cocaine and amphetamines particularly crystal meth or methamphetamine. And so uh, we have a number of patients who've had frank manic episodes and you can't quite tell if they're using drugs and that caused the manic episode because they're genetically susceptible and sort of they have bipolar disorder under the surface and it may not surface without that boost from a drug 
or these people actually were manic and then they started using drugs as part of their mania. They go socially, go to clubs, parties, and they start doing drugs with friends and then they end up in a really bad way. So that's a little bit of a problem. And I didn't talk about it. those people we call bipolar disorder, not otherwise specified. We're not sure if they have a drug induced bipolar disorder or if they have endogenous, but that's getting down into the weeds a little bit too much. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, rapid cycling subtype of bipolar disorder. I'm not really talking about childhood bipolar disorder because I'm not quite convinced that every child who has a cycling mood, a lot of these kids with quote childhood bipolar disorder have ADHD, that is to say they're irritable, they're, 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 they tend to be unfocused, their minds are jumping around, they have wide mood swings. Those individuals, when you look at them in their 20s and 30s, do not evolve into a typical adult pattern of bipolar disorder. So I'm not sure we're not just dealing with depression plus ADHD and a lot of kids with pediatric bipolar disorder. I would get a lot of pushback from my colleagues in pediatric psychiatry, but I think I'm right, but I always think I'm right. <laughs> so how do you treat bipolar disorder? Well, the first thing you have to do is to get buy-in from the individual. You can't treat a patient with a behavioral disorder unless they recognize they have something wrong. And that's called insight. And you know that we have a lot of people in this like a lot on bipolar disorder. I don't want to get too political or polemic here. The old standard for treating bipolar disorder was lithium and is still probably You're the best on one of these pills. Have today are lithium salts. Um, and there's a lot of anecdote about how lithium was discovered. It's an anti-convulcan, Depakote, it's useful. Um, I don't know what, where we're getting that feedback from. Anyway, um, lithium uh, is present in a lot of springs and a lot of spas that have mineral baths, have lithium in it. People have thought that the Romans with their therapeutic baths, or even in places like Hot Springs, Arkansas, that there's a lot of lithium in the water there and people felt better because it's not only has a mood stabilizing effects, but also some antidepressant effects as well. But in any event, lithium still is quite good at mood stabilization and it is uh, used still very widely. It has to be used with some care because it affects on your thyroid gland and it can affect your kidney function. So it's not something that can be just given out willy nilly without monitoring from, 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 the, from a doctor and that's so-called lithium toxicity. We also use anticonvulsants a lot for mood stabilization. So uh, Depakote or Depakine, valproic acid is quite effective for uh, mood stabilization. Um, uh, carbamazepine and oxamazepine have been used uh, off-label uh, primarily, but uh, they are still used for it. And a variety of other anticonvulsants are used. They, they tend to have fewer side effects. Um, and then sometimes people are really just so manic uh, that during the acute manic phase, because they're psychotic, they're, they're delusional, they can even be hallucinating, uh, or they're psychotic in their depressive phase, that they give you an antipsychotic, at least transiently. And some patients need that boost from the antipsychotic because it does seem to have some mood stabilizing effect. What's interesting about lithium, for example, or anticonvulsants is if you give them to a patient who is psychotic with schizophrenia, they have almost no effect on that psychosis which tells you that there is something different about the biology of somebody with bipolar disorder in that they respond to lithium, but if you give a schizophrenic who may have very similar symptoms, lithium does almost nothing to them. These chemicals are working in your brain. They're changing the way nerve cells are communicating with one another. That's how they work. And so there must be something wrong with how these nerve cells are communicating with each other, underlying these mood instability disorders like bipolar disorder. So with that, I'm now going to take you back into biology of illness. So these disorders are highly heritable. That is to say, if you study people with bipolar disorder and take a good family history, it runs in the family. Now, that doesn't prove that it's genetic. Why doesn't it prove that it's genetic? Because it could be environmental. You could be all living in the same environment or have the same environmental stimulus, right? So for example, if I have you live near a coal-fired power plant, you may have a higher incidence of certain types of cancer 
than people who live out in the country. You could say, well, that's genetic. Cancer is running in this family, right? Grandpa had cancer, uh, uh, daughter had cancer, grandson had cancer, right? It's running in the family. And it may be running in the family. There may be a genetic risk factor. But it also could be they all grew up and lived around this coal-fired power plant that was spewing pollutants that are carcinogens, right? So how do you detect what's environmental and what is genetic? And why do we care about what's environmental or genetic? Well, genetics are the key to understanding the biology of a lot of illnesses. Because if we can figure out how the genetic risk factor confers increased risk for illness, that's by changing the biology of a cell, we might be able to normalize that, correct that, and develop very targeted treatments. Now, the same could be true for environmental, but genetics is something that we can test in the lab and get an accurate measure for. So, we are undergoing a revolution in genetics of illness. And those of you who are oncologists or have had cancer or are uh, married to people who are oncologists or onco oncology researchers know that cancer genetics is a huge field. So anybody who's had cancer here, your tissue often goes on for, off for genetic testing. Why is that? Because we know that there are certain genetic abnormalities that underlie cancer that we can have personalized targeted treatment for, just like we would have personalized targeted treatment for your infection. So if you have a cancer, uh, let's say a certain type of breast cancer that has a certain type of receptor on it, you'll get treatment A. If it has, doesn't have it, you'll get treatment B. Well, the same may be true for psychiatric illnesses, although we are way, way far behind people with cancer. Why is that? Partly because we poured huge sums of money into cancer research in this country, number one. Number two, the genetic factors that affect cancer biology change things in cells by tenfold, twentyfold, a hundredfold. In schizophrenia or depression or autism or here, bipolar disorder, it may be by 10%. It's a small change. It's enough to upset the apple cart, but it's very hard biologically to detect. So we have a big revolution in genetic testing. Anybody here done 23andMe? Okay, so 23andMe takes a little bit of saliva, right? And in that saliva are a bunch of cells from the inside of your mouth. And they spin it down, and they extract the DNA, and they look at all your genetic code. So take you back to biology. What are genes? Inside every cell is a nucleus. Inside every nucleus are 23 pairs of chromosomes, hopefully. And each one of those chromosomes contains a code, a blueprint for all the proteins in your body. So there are about 25,000 genes in the human genome packed inside the nucleus of every single cell in your body. And those genes get read out to make your cells function. Those are the blueprints. And everybody's genetic code differs in some small ways, not gigantic ways. Everybody has two eyes, two ears, two arms, two legs, generally. And they all work about the same way. But some people have better memories than other people. Some people have different hair color than other people. Some people have different height than other people. Right? So those are genetic traits that are passed along. People also have complex genetic traits. Some people are more impulsive than other people. Some people are more anxious than other people. So personality traits and characterological traits seem to have a genetic underpinning. So do complex diseases. So what the NIH has done, the NIMH has done, is something called um, uh, Psychiatric Genetics Consortium. And they've spent several billion dollars on this, collecting people from around this country, and to a lesser extent from around the world, and we'll take 100,000 people with bipolar disorder over here and 100,000 people who have been very carefully screened are completely normal from a psychiatric perspective. And they'll look in your genetic code at 2.5 million places. And your genetic code is billions of words long. Okay, But they'll look at 2.5 million places where we know there tends to be some rapid differences in people, a, a high frequency of differences in people. And they'll see, if you have bipolar disorder, what are the differences in your genetic code compared to the normal people? And now, they're looking at 2.5 million sites. 
And there's what we call a lot of false positives there meaning just by chance you're going to find a difference. So you have to use very sophisticated and stringent statistics to come up with abnormalities in the genetic code that are associated with increased risk for bipolar disorder. And so, if you look, these are each one of the 26, 23 pairs of chromosomes. This is chromosome one here. And this line here says everything above this line shows a difference in genetic code that is increased in people or that that particular genetic change is associated with increased risk for bipolar disorder. And you can say, ah, oh, you've discovered the genetic background for bipolar disorder. It's multiple genes, right, of small effect, all working together to change the way your brain functions. It's not quite that simple because this just tells you where in the genetic code the abnormality is. It doesn't tell you which gene and each gene makes a, a protein or a family of proteins, which gene is involved. And so my group at the Lieber Institute has done probably the largest study ever done in the world. It was published in Nature Neuroscience in March of this year, which is a well-regarded journal, one of the better journals in the world on uh, biology of, of illness, of brain illnesses. And so they identified 64 spaces in the genetic code with abnormalities associated with bipolar disorder. Our job is to say, what is that actually doing in the brain of people with bipolar disorder? So with my colleague at the Bloomberg School of Public Health in the Department of Psychiatry, Johns Hopkins, Peter Zandi and I, in a major study funded by the National Institute of Mental Health over the course of the past five years, have done the world's largest study comparing about 140 people with bipolar disorder, their brains, to 140 people uh, who were, to the best of our ability, normal. Well, deceased, but normal. Um, and we had multiple findings in the brain. Um, and let me just take you along. And we studied two regions in the brain. Now, your brain, anybody here seen a actual brain, human brain, outside the head? One, one person. It's about the size of a cantaloupe, usually and it has hundreds and hundreds of different structures in it that are doing all types of different things. And so we used to say in neurology where you're trained, you learn brain anatomy a stroke at a time. So if you have a stroke here, you lose language function. You have a stroke here, you get paralyzed on your left arm. You have a stroke here, you get paralyzed on your left leg, okay? You have a stroke here in the back of the brain, it affects visual function. You have a stroke here in the front of the brain, you may get depressed. You get another stroke at a different place in the brain, you may become bipolar. Yes, strokes can cause depression. Strokes can cause bipolar. You're probably saying to yourself, well, if I had a stroke, of course I would be depressed. That is true, <laughs> right? I mean, nobody's happy to have a stroke. But these are people who have almost no other neurological deficits and never had depression before. And their only change in brain function seems to be depression. So those types of things tell us, well, there are parts of the brain that are involved in mood regulation. That makes sense. You don't just have moods. Everything that you do, all the behavior that you do is mediated by your brain, whether it's normal behavior or abnormal behavior. If you're hungry, those, that conscious representation of a need to eat or a desire to eat is based upon certain circuits in the brain, certain interconnected structures. If you're happy, if you feel sated or satisfied after a meal, if you want to have sexual relations, if you want to read a book, if you appreciate pleasure from a movie or a piece of music, these are all part of your brain function. It sounds very reductive that we're taking everything down to an organic basis, but there is an organic basis to how our thoughts work, how our consciousness works. And so in bipolar disorder, there are certain parts of the brain that we know that are involved in regulation of mood. Your mood is regulated. You're not always happy. You're not always, I hope, you're not always sad. You're not always mentally fatigued. You're not always mentally sharp. You're not always sentimental. You're not always elated. But we know from certain types of imaging studies and certain types of stroke studies in the brain, as well as some animal studies, that there are parts of the brain that are very involved in mood regulation. So I'm going to teach you two words today. One is called the amygdala which is a very primitive part of the brain that's involved in what we call vegetative functions of the body. But it's very important in aggression, anxiety, and mood regulation. And it sort of ties your consciousness to the organic functions of your body. So 
when somebody is upset or angry or anxious or manic, their heart rate will go up, their breathing patterns will change, their skin conducts and they sweat, the size of your pupils will change. These are all types of physical changes that are associated with emotional state, right? For those of you who, 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 who have studied these things, I'm telling you this is true. And so we know that the amygdala is very involved. So that's one area of the brain we study. The second is a place deep in the core of the brain called the subgenual cingulate cortex, which is very important in depression and in uh, bipolar disorder. And people are using something called transcranial magnetic stimulation, where they put very powerful magnets on the surface of the brain and actually direct the magnetic pulse towards the subgenual cingulate gyrus and it can alleviate depression in certain treatment resistant people with depression. It sounds like it's something from another world. It is very futuristic, but it actually works. There are some people who have such in incapacitated depression that is so treatment unresponsive that they actually get an electrical stimulator put into the subgenual cingulate cortex. And that is turned on and alleviates their depressive mood. That is only done for the most severe forms of intractable depression. But we know from these studies that this part of the brain is very involved in mood regulation. We don't, it, these, by the way, this study is very expensive. This study cost over $5 million to do. These assays are extremely painstaking. The acquisition of each brain, it costs us just to acquire a brain and process it without any scientific work done on it, over $20,000. Well, you can do the math of 4,000 brains times $20,000. We have invested a fortune in accruing these brains, and the NIH invested a fortune in this study. Fortunately, it worked out, and we had some very good publisher results. Otherwise, I wouldn't get funded anymore. Um, but in any event, we found a lot of changes in gene expression in the brains of these individuals comparing normal individuals to people with bipolar disorder. And we had to winnow it down, and we were particularly interested in genes that were near those 63, 64 sites in the brain that we know from the clinical study that are different. And we were able to narrow down which genes, because these little changes can be sometimes between two genes. Is it the gene on the left or is it the gene on the right that's being altered in its structure, function, or the level of the gene, the protein from that gene, I should say, in the brain? And these are done on mRNA, and I don't want to get too much into the weeds. We're doing some protein studies, but mRNA is more stable than protein in the brain. And we found differences between the two uh, areas of the brain in bipolars versus normals. We found many more in that subgenual region than in the amygdala. Uh, I don't want to go into the detail why, but we found some changes that were present in both regions of the brain. And those, re those that were found in both regions, both in the amygdala and the sub genuine cingulate gyrus are the ones that are of most interest to us. So one of the genes that we found, and this is, it, it, and probably is the biggest finding, is something called SCN2A, which means absolutely nothing to anybody here. But what it is, is it controls the firing of nerve cells. It's very important how nerve cells fire. And it's abnormally expressed in both regions in the brain. And what's important about it is, it's a sodium channel, which means that it is targetable with a drug. You could block it or you can enhance its function. And so the question is, can we do that without perturbing too much of brain function? So if you get too, too um, zealous with your medication, you can overstimulate these receptors and cause seizures. And if you block it too much, you put anybody to sleep, usually is what happens when you overblock receptors in the brain. So uh, we are playing around trying to figure out, is there some way we can modulate this and normalize its function? But this is the type of finding that you can get from these studies. You can identify particular genetic abnormalities which seem to underlie bipolar disorder uh, and is specific to bipolar disorder. And this is just shows that what, how complex this is. This protein sits on the membrane of the cell and it is very important in what we call action potentials or the firing rate of each nerve cell. It is vitally important. Interesting thing about this, there are variants of this that are associated with educational attainment and IQ as well. Yes? Does this give you any insight into why lithium works? That's a very good question. Why does lithium work? Because lithium binds to, presumably, receptors on nerve cells. 
We're not sure. We have some preliminary data, but we are working on that. The answer is that's, some, that's a very good question and something that we are, are studying at this moment. Could this be the way that lithium works in the brain is by modulating the activity of this receptor on nerve cells? We don't know yet is the answer, but it could. And we know that changes in this gene have been associated with certain types of autism and certain type of epilepsy. And so this gene does seem to be very involved in pathologies in the brain, not only bipolar disorder. So if we're gonna monkey around with how this is working in the brain, we better be pretty careful with it because we don't wanna make people to start having social deficits like uh, in autism. We don't wanna change it around or its activity around so much they start developing seizures. Yes? Those are separate studies. Um, yes, we can. Uh, when we looked at this part of the, when we looked at these structures in the brain, none of the genes for serotonin transmission came up for bipolar. None of the genes for uh, dopamine transmission came up or acetylcholine or norepinephrine. I would take issue with one study that suggested that, nor, that serotonin isn't involved in depression. There are a lot of studies that show that serotonin is very involved in the biology of depression. Whether it is the primary cause of depression or is something sort of downstream from the primary cause, but it is quite clear in a significant proportion of patients that uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors like uh, citalopram or fluoxetine, what we used to call it, you know, uh, Prozac, Zoloft, uh, Selexa, Lexapro, work by altering serotonergic transmission by enhancing it. And by enhancing it in at least a subset of patients with depression, it can be quite effective. Same thing with norepinephrine transmitter, uh, uh, um, norepinephrine uh, reuptake inhibitors. So um, I, I, I think it's probably not what I would ascribe to to say serotonin uh, or norepinephrine are not involved in depression in many patients. Anyway, just to finish up with this, so this is, this is one of the things, and, and, and we found a whole bunch of findings in this study that gives us some clues of some of the genes that might be involved or genetic abnormalities that are involved underlying bipolar disorder. And this gives us a window into doing a whole host of studies. We can now take these uh, genetic abnormalities uh, and look at them in cell cultures. We can take mice and make these abnormalities in them. We can make these abnormalities in specific, we can do all types of very wild through gene editing uh, techniques very specific changes in the mice, so it's only restricted to these two structures in the mouse brain. So we can do with something called CRISPR and genetic editing. So we can develop animal models, which allows us to have a new way of testing and um, cellular models of testing compounds that might normalize the functions of these genetic changes and then have therapeutic value for people. Medications that are better tolerated with fewer side effects and are more efficacious more effective in people. It also gives us a chance perhaps towards personalized medicine. There may be 65 genes that confer major risk for bipolar disorder and any given individual doesn't have just one of these. They may have five to 10 or 15 of the bad so-called bad abnormalities, okay? And in concert together, they produce bipolar disorder. And we can develop perhaps uh, genetic tests and say, you have this group of genes, you have this group of genes, you have this group of genes. And if you have this group of genes, you should go on medication A. And if you have this group of genes, medication B. And this group of genes, medication C. <clears throat> and that's hopefully what the future of personalized medicine directed pharmacology will be. The same way that we have personalized medicine directed pharmacology towards respiratory tract infections, right? If you have a staph infection, you get A. If you have a strep infection, you get B. You have a pseudomonas infection, you get C. You don't treat every infection with the same antibiotic. It depends upon what the person has. And that's what we need to do with these complex behavioral disorders. And hopefully, if we have more efficacious treatment with fewer side effects, 
we can get patients to comply better with the medications. But ultimately, some of that compliance issue will come in from better understanding of these disorders in individuals. If you can show them, hey, we did this genetic test, you have these genetic abnormalities, this is the biology, this is the reality of your situation. The same way an oncologist could say, hey, we biopsied that lump on your left arm, this is what it came back, here's the pathologist's report, you can see it in black and white in front of you or on the computer screen in front of you, and this is what I would recommend that we do to treat it. And hopefully that will take us to a better place with compliance. I just want to mention that these studies that I talked to you about are not done by me and Peter Zandi together. This takes a big team of individuals, starting with the brain collection team. We have over 20 people involved in the brain collection at a budget of about $2.5 million a year. As I said, it's extremely uh, expensive to collect these brains and to curate them and store them. You, we have over 60 deep freezers. They're all stored at minus 80 degrees. Each freezer costs about eleven dollars or $12,000, and they only last for about seven years. So you can imagine the space involved, the personnel involved. We have to carefully label each one because you don't want to mix up brain A with brain B. You don't want to have you know, normal and abnormal like in Young Frankenstein reverse, <laughs> right? So it takes a lot of curation. These studies were done by my team, my colleague Joel Kleiman, who I've worked with for nearly 30 years. Are, 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 we have to have a whole statistics team involved, bioinformatics. It's not like doing a t-test anymore on your, uh, cal on your HP calculator. These are very complex uh, computer analytics requiring a huge computer cores. Imagine ev evaluating 2.5 million data points on each subject. You can imagine times 100 subjects. It, that's way beyond my capacity to do. Andrew Jaffe and, and, and Leo Colado Torres did that. And then there's a whole team on the Hopkins side as well. And this is just a picture of our staff um, right before COVID. Um, fortunately, um, we hadn't lost anybody in the staff to COVID. We've had a few people move on. But uh, we are actively pursuing our research at the Lieber Institute across uh, a number of domains. We have a, a drug in development in collaboration with the major pharmaceutical company for cognitive enhancement that we think will be useful for uh, schizophrenia, Parkinson's disease, and Alzheimer's disease, and other forms of dementia, and may be useful in ADHD as well. Uh, and so we are charging forward. And uh, I thank you all for your attention, and any questions you have, I'm happy to field. Uh, doctor, we'll funnel the questions through the microphone so they can be shared with our virtual audience, which is twice the size. Okay. There is not much of a mention of behavioral therapy. Is there a value to that, perhaps in combination with drugs? Yes, absolutely. So, as I, as, as I mentioned before in the talk, one of the biggest obstacles in bipolar disorder in particular is insight. And behavioral therapy in just about every psychiatric disease, especially mood disorders, uh, the most effective outcomes are people who have a combination of medication plus behavioral therapy. So if you look at the hierarchy of effectiveness of treatment, medication plus behavioral therapy is up here, medication alone is here, Beh behavioral therapy alone is here, and nothing is down here, okay? So each one of these uh, is very, uh, uh, has some efficacy, but if you combine medication with behavioral therapy, you have by far in the way the best outcome. It's not just additive, it's synergistic, it's multiplicative. So yes, behavioral therapy. It's also probably, probably the hardest thing to get people with bipolar disorder to do. If you think it's hard getting the medication, try to get them to go to a therapist once a week, but it really makes a big difference because they'll start to gain insight into the disorder, not only as how it affects their life, but how it affects other people's lives, and therefore medication compliance is improved as well, as well as uh, learning some insight about how to recognize when their mood is becoming unstable, unstable so they can contact their physician for medication adjustments. Thank you. Is, is there any research establishing a uh, relationship between bipolar disorder and um, brain trauma, such as a serious concussion, a very serious concussion? Yeah. You know, as I said before, there have been a, a number of studies from stroke, for example, showing that people with certain types of stroke can, can develop a new onset bipolar disorder after their stroke. With respect to concussions, it's much more common to see um, depression, irritable depression, than it is frank bipolar disorder. I'm sure it's been reported, but it's not one of the main sequelae. Much more after brain trauma, you see uh, uh, depression with irritability and hostility. Yeah. 
Yes. For years and years of working for the Environmental Protection Agency, I see epidemiology study after epidemiology study after epidemiology study, and the best they can say is we've got an association. And you have people saying, um, oh yeah, Camp Lejeune, uh, you can have any number of you know, 20 or 30 uh, disorders, well, that, that's caused by Camp Lejeune, or, or dioxin, Agent Orange, or uh, I had a grandkid who was born with spinal bifida, and my dad was from Agent Orange. It strike, strikes me that the epidemiology studies really can't say much, except maybe asbestos and mesothelioma. Um, where do you put your studies on that spectrum? Because it seems to me you almost haven't found one thing that you could say for sure is actually caused by this, or a few things that are caused. Mm -hmm. It seems like you're way down on the spectrum of what an epidemiology study can. Could you repeat the question? So, it, it's a good question. How, how do you go from association, saying that you found this in association, to causality, saying this definitely causes this, this, and this? And there's a few ways you can do that. Number one is to say, if we know that we have somebody who has a particular abnormality in one of these genes, what is the readout in that individual, right? So if we study families of individuals who have particular abnormalities, we know, for example, an SCN2A. Is there a readout? And the answer is yes. The readout we know is autism spectrum if we have one type of abnormality or family of abnormalities. The second readout is epilepsy in another type of group of families. And that's been shown with very detailed, fine genetic testing. So we know that alterations in these genes can alter brain functions in profound ways in behavior and excitability. When we go into cell culture, by making abnormalities in this gene, we can see differences in firing pattern, similar to the genetic abnormalities that we're seeing here. So we know this genetic abnormality is affecting firing pattern of nerve cells. Now, to go from there to a readout of behavioral changes requires much more complex testing. And so we would then move into animal studies because although animals don't become bipolar, there are certain features of bipolar disorder, changes in sleep-wake cycle, activity cycle, that are similar between people with bipolar disorder and animals with genetic abnormalities associated with people who have bipolar disorder. And so that's how you get to causality. But you're quite right that they, these are associations, but they're associations based upon a pre-existing biology, which is, a little, which is the same way that you would go with causality in cancer, right? So you find that people who are exposed to asbestos, right? develop a certain type of tumor in the chest called a mesothelioma. So if you take certain cells from certain, in culture, right, from certain parts of the tissues that are involved in the normal cells in mesothelioma, expose them to asbestos, do you get a change? Is there increased risk of what we call, I'm not an oncologist, but oncogenic characteristics, tumor-like characteristics? And the answer is yes, you can do that. And that's how you prove causality. It's the same way that when the EPA says, for example, that there's an increased risk of cancer if you have high levels of exposure to, say, benzene, for example, that's not just based upon the fact that people who live near benzene or have higher levels of benzene in their liver have a higher incidence of cancer. It's also based by the fact that in cell culture and animal studies, if you expose people to high level, uh, these animals and cells to high levels of benzene, you convert their cells from normal cells certain susceptible tissues to cancer cells. And so then you get a therapeutic range. How much do you need to get that, right? So we do the same thing. We take these types of studies and the next stage are cellular and animal studies, some of which have been done, some of which are underway. But we have no doubt that the readout from these cells changes brain function. We know that. The question is, how is it doing it? And I think that, uh, Given the strictness of our uh, genetic um, statistics here, we feel fairly confident that these are not just casual associations, 
but meaningful biological associations. Does that answer your question? So, so at what amounts? I mean, you can say there's an association, right? But at what amount? Of On its own, probably not that high. Remember, I said these are these are disorders of multiple genes. So having just this abnormality probably may do nothing to you. But in concert with six others, it may have a profound effect on you. And that's what we think is at work here. It's like dosing. So let's move on to our virtual audience. Uh, yeah. Terry? Exactly. Hi. Um, Laura Ferguson would like to know, what is the connection between bipolar disorder and epilepsy? Um, it's a good question. It depends upon the studies that you look at. Probably not as well established as, a, as the link between a bi, uh, uh, epilepsy and schizophrenia. But it is true that the amygdala, that part of the brain, that one of the parts of the brain we studied, that we know that if you have certain types of scars in the amygdala, uh, it can generate uh, epileptic activity. And so it may be, and it probably is to a certain extent, that there is a slightly increased risk of epilepsy in people with bipolar disorder, but it's not that strong of a risk. Why do anticonvulsants work? Well, anticonvulsants work in epilepsy the same way they may work in bipolar disorder, and that's by stabilizing nerve cell firing. And it may be, and it's sort of, sort of a uh, loose association, that you have nerve cells firing too much in certain regions of the brain in both epilepsy and in bipolar disorder. But the manifestation, a seizure is quite different than a manic episode. And Judy Bloom, uh, Blumberg uh, would like to know, uh, or ask, please address the use of ECT. Uh, ECT is used uh, almost exclusively for uh, depression. Um, it has been used in bipolar disorder, it has been used in schizophrenia, it's been used in OCD. Um, I don't think uh, it's recommended for bipolar disorder, even intractable types. It is recommended, particularly in older folks uh, with intractable depression who have failed multiple pharmacological trials. Although people are uh, using unipolar uh, ECT because it seems to have less cognitive uh, side effects. And there are some people who really benefit from ECT. It certainly snaps people out of depression uh, relatively quickly. And the question is, can you keep them in what we call a normal mood state? I don't know why I'm turning it to you, because it's virtual over there. Okay. And the last question I have right now is from Hannah Gould. And um, excuse me if I mispronounce this uh, drug. Do, does cyclothymia, cy cyclothymia. Cy cyclothymia occur along with bipolar what age group is most, is, is most occurrences of cyclothymia? So, you know, these are mutually exclusive diagnoses. Either you have cyclothymia or you have bipolar disorder. You don't have both. Because if you have cyclothymia, which is a, a little bit less dramatic mood fluctuations, but still abnormal, uh, but at that some point you flip over into a huge mood fluctuation, now you're bipolar forevermore. But if you stay in these pathological mood swings, you're still cyclothymia. Um, age range, cyclothymia also presents in its 20s generally, although um, some people say uh, teenagers often show it naturally. Those of you who've raised teenagers know that there are wide mood swings which seem to come without uh, particular stimulus and uh, you oftentimes would like to medicate those individuals but you just have to be a good parent and uh, see them through that time and hopefully keep them alive till they're about 21 or 22 and usually those things dampen out. It's impressive that uh, two families seem to have become, been the principal funders of this remarkable research. What do you see as the future for other sources, and where do you want to go with how much money? Well, um, you know, to paraphrase the, the Duchess of Windsor. Re Repeat the question. It was hard to understand. Rich are too well funded. Um, <laughs> these, these studies are exceptionally expensive. Um, we're, we, we, we sadly lost the last uh, uh, founder from the Lieber side. Steve Lieber actually probably passed away of COVID uh, in 2020. Um, although he was 95, he lived a, a rich life. And he was quite generous in his um, uh, will, leaving us money. But um, we continue to solicit donations. We've had a number of families. 
Actually, a number of our brain donor families have stepped up and donated not millions, but in the thousands of dollars. We get a lot of grants from the National Institutes of Health uh, to fund this research. Uh, but we do have a development arm, and we are actively uh, soliciting support. The future, well, we have a wide portfolio. We want to take and do these types of studies in many other disorders. So I have a big study going on Parkinson's disease right now. We're working with a, the Ludwig Foundation, Carol Ludwig, uh, who actually was a neurologist. Her father used to own the Baltimore Orioles, uh, Judge Hoffberger. Um, and so they're funding a study in Alzheimer's disease right now. So we solicit donations from foundations, from individuals, and we have a number of grants from uh, National Institute of Health. We also have had, had some uh, support for our PTSD work from the Department of Veterans Affairs and the Defense Department, although more from the VA than the Department of Defense, because once you get a mental illness, the Department of Defense boots you out, and, uh, and, and it's the VA that's left to pick up the pieces afterwards. Well, how, long, how much more of time do we have? That was a great talk. Anyway, that was a great talk, and uh, there, there are not that many scientists who can translate, you know, cutting edge work into something that's understandable by a general audience. Uh, I have one question. I don't know if you see patients, but and I don't. I'm just wondering if you share, if you or your colleagues have shared some of these developments with your patients, and whether how that affects them. Does it make them feel uh, relieved, or they have are they despairing? Well, my patient work. I, I saw patients for a long, long time. Um, I'm a neurologist with additional psychiatric training, so I saw hybrid patients with both neurological and psychiatric problems. Uh, the only clinical work I, I do really now is, is because of my do good nature, and that's working with public defenders' offices and working with them in the forensic area. Um, sharing this with patients. So uh, one of our colleagues, Fernando Goes, who's working with me on a very similar study in major depression, um, does actively see patients with depression. Um, we try to share, in general, the, the larger overview that these are biologically based disorders and that you need to be faithful in your treatment because they're biologically based in the same way a diabetic patient should be faithful in following diet and medication regimens. And we get probably about the same compliance as we do in diabetes, which is to say it's mixed. But I always like to think that an informed patient is a better patient and will be a more compliant patient and will be more comfortable with the illnesses. I think there's still a lot of stigma associated, and I, I see Leah Rita nodding because she's actively involved in this sphere still. There's still a lot of stigma involved in mental illness, and it, it, it's the only thing, it's the only, it's the only domain that we talk more about mental health than mental illness. We don't talk about cardiac health or hepatic health or, derm well, maybe we talk about dermatological health a little bit, but these are illnesses. These are, these are diseases. These are not defects of character and will. Although certain people in this country would like you to believe that. And so we try to orient people towards the biology to understand these medications are working on biology and that they have a biological illness the same way heart disease, hypertension, diabetes. But you know, one of the hardest things to do as a physician or a therapist is to get buy-in from your patient. And so you know, there's a, people study the dynamics of treatment and how do you get patients to buy in? And the best way is, in my viewpoint, is by being able to talk to your patient, to explain things, not like they're an idiot, but not like they're a scientist either. And I've had people with seventh grade educations who have a very good understanding of what is going on. I have people with PhDs who seem to be oblivious to the biological nature of their illness, whether it's heart disease or whatever. And so all around us, we say, you know, we have problems with individuals taking their medication, going to see doctors in a timely fashion. We have a medical system which values diagnostic testing over patient physician or patient nurse practitioner time and interface. And then we wonder why our outcomes are so poor. It's because you're not establishing that therapeutic alliance. You're not giving oftentimes the individuals the wherewithal to understand their disease. And in many situations, too, we don't supply people with the knowledge of what they can do in their environment. 
to help mitigate. So some of the things that I tell my patients with bipolar disorder, it's very important to have a good sleep-wake cycle. If you start finding that your sleeping is getting off, let me know. That can be the harbinger of a manic or a depressive episode. You have to let me know if the medication is being tolerated. Do we need to tweak it up? Do we need to take, tweak it down? Every patient is different in how they metabolize the medications, how they have side effects of the medications. We need to know, are they managing their stress levels in their life? Because stress can be an exacerbator, an instigator of a decompensation, either into bipolar depression, bipolar mania, psychosis. And so there's a lot of things that we can do around the edges to work with your patients. Unfortunately, there's not a recognition that that can be so important. And so just a quick anecdote uh, from the scientific level. So one of the things that they do very well in, in, in the United Kingdom is they're able, because it's a centralized health system, to track diseases. And they can track things like rehospitalization, which is extremely expensive, thousands and thousands of dollars a day. And they discovered it was better to have every schizophrenia patient managed by a caseworker who may only have four or five patients. And that may sound like very few patients for a caseworker who's being paid $50,000 or $60,000 a year. But if you can just prevent one hospitalization a year about those five patients, or even one emergency room visit, it pays for itself. And so we haven't gotten that degree of realization. There are certain parts of this country, Kaiser, for example, is pretty good with case management. Um, but we're developing some algorithms that we can give patients to use to identify when they're decompensating. And it seems to be helpful the way that Kaiser now has an algorithm, which is actually developed by an old colleague of mine, that can tell when you come to the emergency room if you have an infection, if you're at high risk for, for generalized sepsis, for example, which is a life-threatening complication of, say, a bladder infection or a lung infection. And so hopefully you can develop these paradigms and these algorithms as well and marry science to the art of medicine. <laughs> Why don't we stop there? Well, that was a really special presentation. We thank you so much for your talk and your willingness to answer our questions. Um, I want to prepare you for next month's presentation where a temple member, Alan Cooperman, who's the director of religion research at Pew Research Center, he will sp uh, speak about the effect of COVID on religious communities, particularly whether it's been disruptive or productive, and focusing on Jewish congregations particularly. He's been a member here for a number of years with his wife and his two sons who were bar mitzvah here. I also wanted to thank our home team, Harriet, my co-chair now, and uh, so many of us who worked so hard to put this together uh, Jerry, Barbara, David, Janelle, um, Sid, and the whole Lunch and Learn Committee. Thank you so much for helping it continue and helping it flourish. So we'll see you next month, September 14th, for Alan Cooperman. <laughs>